When people talk about going back to the moon, most think it is just a repeat of Apollo. A rocket goes up, astronauts land, they come home. It sounds simple, it is not. The plan today is very different. The biggest difference is how many times people must switch vehicles in space. This is a crucial area of risk. First, let's explain what space travel really means. To stay near the moon, a spacecraft must move sideways very fast. That sideways speed keeps it from falling. It is like throwing a rock so hard it keeps missing the ground. That path around the moon is called lunar orbit. Orbit just means going around without falling. NASA's Artemis plan starts on Earth. Astronauts launch inside a capsule called Orion. Orion sits on top of a huge rocket called SLS. SLS is tall. It is about 98 meters tall. That is taller than a football field is long. It is powerful. The engine power at launch is like lighting 40 million horses at once. SLS pushes Orion toward the moon. Orion travels for about three days. That is the same as driving nonstop from New York to Los Angeles, but straight up and far past it. When Orion reaches the moon, it does not land. It stays in orbit. Here is the first handoff. The astronauts do not land in Orion. They must move to another ship. That ship is a separate lunar lander. It is built by a company hired by NASA. To get there, Orion must dock. Docking means two spacecraft slowly connect in space. It is like parking two cars bumper to bumper while both are moving fast. Docking is hard. Both ships move fast. One mistake and they drift apart. Once docked, astronauts climb from Orion into the lander. They leave Orion behind. The lander then fires its engines to head down to the moon. It must slow down just right, too fast, and it crashes. After landing, astronauts do their work. They walk, they collect rocks, they set up tools, then they must leave. The lander lifts off. It goes back to lunar orbit. It must meet Orion again. That is another docking. Then astronauts climb back into Orion. Then Orion fires its engine to head home. Count the steps, launch, travel, dock, transfer, land, lift off, dock again, transfer again, return. Each step must work. If one fails, the mission can fail. More parts mean more ways to fail. SpaceX's plan removes some of those steps. SpaceX uses Starship as the lunar lander. Starship is massive. It is about 50 meters tall. That is like a 15-story building. It can carry over 100 tons of cargo that is as heavy as 15 fully loaded pickup trucks. In SpaceX's approach, astronauts still launch from Earth on Orion and SLS for Artemis. This part stays the same for now. But once in lunar orbit, they board Starship. Starship is already there waiting. It was sent ahead of time without people. Starship then does everything. It lands on the moon. It lifts off. It returns to lunar orbit. Astronauts move back to Orion. One lander does the full job. Less switching means less risk. This is technical system mastery. The biggest difference is reuse. Starship is reusable. Reusable means you use it again, like reusing a truck instead of throwing it away after one delivery. Space hardware is expensive. Reuse spreads cost over many missions. Apollo landers were left on the moon. They were built to fly once. That was fine in the 1960s. Back then, speed mattered more than cost. Today, cost matters. Every billion dollars could build thousands of homes or schools. Let's talk numbers. One SLS launch costs $4.1 billion according to NASA's own Inspector General. That's billion with a B. That is enough money to buy everyone in Houston a new car. Starship aims to cost far less per flight once it is fully working. Direct cost comparison number one. One SLS launch costs 410 times more than one Starship launch. That same $4.1 billion billion dollars could pay for 410 Starship launches. This shows resource protection. The cost driver is clear. SLS is thrown away after one launch. Every time. $4.1 billion is enough to build about 8,000 new schools. SpaceX flips this. They accept higher risk early. They test. They fail. They learn. That lowers long-term cost. Direct cost comparison number two. 
the full Artemis stack per landing can exceed $4 billion, while SpaceX's approach aims to stay near $2.4 billion. That is almost half the cost. The fact that NASA picked SpaceX for the lunar lander after competition confirms this cost saving. While SpaceX builds many ships and tests them fast, NASA builds fewer systems and protects them heavily. This approach slows decisions and raises prices. Boeing builds parts of SLS. Their costs rose, schedules slipped. That added pressure. That shows what happens when systems grow too complex and slow to change. This is a pattern recognized throughout large government projects. Starship needs a lot of fuel. To get to the moon and back, it must be filled in space. Tanker starships bring the fuel. This happens far from people. Refueling in space is just moving liquid from one tank to another. The same thing happens when a tanker truck fills a gas station tank. It is not magic. It is plumbing in zero gravity. During early fuel transfer tests, valves almost froze. Engineers noticed pressure drops. They stopped the test seconds before damage. They changed the design. That is problem solving in action. Fast testing finds problems early. This information hunt improves safety. Now we look at the specific design. Starship is not one machine, it is a family of ships. The one that lands is special, it is called Starship HLS. HLS means human landing system. It is built to land people on the moon. It is not meant to come back to Earth. This single choice changes the whole design. The moon has no air. A normal starship needs a thick heat shield to come through Earth's air. The air heats the ship like a blowtorch. HLS does not need a heat shield. Removing it saves weight. Less weight means more room for cargo or fuel. Normal Starship also has fins to steer in air. On the moon, fins do nothing, so HLS has no fins. This focus turns Starship from a flying truck into a space-only machine. The engines are different too. A normal Starship engine blasts a huge crater on the moon. Lunar dust is sharp like broken glass. It flies everywhere and can damage equipment. To solve this, HLS uses different landing engines placed higher up on the ship. They fire sideways and downward at angles. This reduces damage to the ground. It keeps dust away from the ship. HLS also uses solar panels. Solar panels turn sunlight into power. A day on the moon lasts about two weeks. That gives a lot of sunlight. HLS can stay active longer without burning fuel for power. That matters for missions that last days or weeks. Since HLS is tall, astronauts exit using elevators. Ladders would be impractical and risky from such a height. Falling on the moon is dangerous. Elevators add complexity, but engineers weighed risk versus complexity and chose safety. Direct cost comparison number three. HLS can carry over 100 tons of cargo to the moon. That's about as heavy as 15 fully loaded pickup trucks. Apollo could carry only a few tons. That is a leap in capability. Bigger car Cargo means more tools, more experiments, more safety margin. This technical mastery feeds into Mars missions. Starship is designed for Mars. That means every system must work far from Earth. Communications delay on Mars is long. Commands take minutes. Systems must be autonomous. Autonomous means they think for themselves within limits. Designing for Mars makes moon missions easier. The moon is closer. Problems can be fixed faster. This is strategic intelligence. Now let's look at the competition. China wants to land people on the moon by about 2030. That is five years from now. To do this, China is not copying SpaceX's huge ship. It is copying the older proven path. China will not land its main cruise ship on the moon. The cruise ship, Mengzhou, stays in orbit. Orbit is the safe highway around the moon. The actual landing is done by another vehicle called Lanyu, which means moon leap. It is smaller, it is lighter, it carries two two astronauts. This means two launches. One launch sends the cruise ship, another launch sends the lander. They meet around the moon and dock. This approach is safer. Smaller landers need less engine power. That makes them easier to control. Lanyu has multiple engines. That means backups. 
If one fails, another can help. China has practiced this docking many times with their space station. They are not guessing. They trust proven paths. China will use Long March 10, their new heavy rocket. It lifts a lot, but less than Starship. China does not need more. Their system is split. Smaller pieces fit smaller rockets. That reduces unknowns. China has landed robots on the moon and returned samples twice. That is complex. They did it twice. The United States has not returned moon samples since 1972. That gap matters. China filled it. That gives them confidence. This is competence demonstration. Direct timeline comparison number one. SLS took over a decade to reach its first flight. Starship went from first steel ring to orbital attempts in a few years. Direct timeline comparison number two. SLS flies about once every one or two years. Starship aims for many flights per year. More practice usually wins in efficiency. Direct timeline comparison number three. China says 2030. NASA aims for Artemis III in the mid to late 2020s, but schedules slip. If NASA delays again, China gets closer. China has been very good at hitting their deadlines. Their space station was built on time. Their moon robots were on time. NASA's recent record is the opposite. This is the competitive scoreboard. China accepts throwaway rockets for now. They have not shown reuse yet at this scale. That gives SpaceX a cost advantage. But reuse is less critical for the moon than Mars. Lunar missions are rare. Each mission is special. China accepts higher one-time cost for lower technical risk. This means more money goes to new hardware, not just operations. China's system is based on vertical control. One agency, one goal, fewer voices. While SpaceX is trying to solve the problem by simplifying the hardware, China is solving it by simplifying the organization. Both aim for the same result, a safe landing. China's plan looks old because old works. Apollo proved it. Artemis repeats it, China copies it, that is discipline. In the end, China's moon plan is careful, it is layered, it uses known tools, it limits risk, it moves steadily, that makes it dangerous in a race. Quiet runners often finish strong, the difference is simple. NASA uses many separate expensive pieces that are thrown away. Starship uses one reusable piece that needs complex fueling in space. China uses two small throwaway pieces that need complex docking. It is all engineering trade-offs. Bigger ship, more fuel, more testing, but simpler flight. Fewer pieces mean fewer cracks. That simplicity is why Starship stands out. It does not remove risk. It moves risk to testing on Earth and orbit far from people. And that is why many engineers pay attention. Because in space, simple usually wins. By 2030, we will know who judged risk best. The one who lands first writes the next chapter. Now let's dive deeper into the financial and human decisions that created this situation. The billions spent on the Space Launch System, or SLS, are not just about the rocket itself. They include the ground support, the launch pads, and the huge factory buildings that make the parts. The total cost of the SLS program is difficult to pin down exactly, but it is clear it has absorbed a huge portion of NASA's budget for years. The first test flight Artemis the Frying was a success. The rocket flew. The capsule came home. That demonstrated capability. But at what cost? Cost comparison number four. The cost of SLS development is over $20 billion. That's billion with a B. That is enough money to run the entire public school system for a major city like Chicago for over three years. That staggering number is what happens when a system is designed to be thrown away after one use and built over many years by many different companies spread across the country. The contracts were structured to preserve jobs and industrial capability, which are important political goals, but they are not the most efficient way to build a rocket. The phrase, while SpaceX NASA, highlights a key tension. While SpaceX focused on rapid iterative development and full reusability, NASA was bound by older rules. SpaceX built the Falcon 9 rocket and made it fully reusable. They demonstrated over 200 successful landings. This is a technical triumph that proves the competence hierarchy. Results talk. 
While SpaceX showed that reuse was possible and cheap, NASA was required to continue funding the SLS program because it was already years into development and employed thousands of people. Engineers knew that building a rocket that is thrown away is financially wasteful. They knew that a reusable rocket would be cheaper in the long run. The original space shuttle was supposed to be reusable, but it never achieved the low-cost, quick turnaround that was promised. The SLS reused the same engines, the RS-25s, from the space shuttle. Those engines are powerful, but they are complex and must be serviced and thrown away after each flight. That is why the cost is so high. The Starliner failure mentions are kept to two. Boeing built the Starliner crew capsule for NASA alongside SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Starliner suffered a major technical failure on its first uncrewed test in 2019. It failed to reach the International Space Station because of software and timing problems. The mission was a near disaster. Engineers knew there were deep-seated issues in the vehicle's software testing and oversight. The second uncrewed flight was successful after years of delay and fixes. This demonstrates the consequences of rushed or poorly managed development. The time and money lost on fixing Starliner could have gone to other programs. The Boeing problem section is kept to three paragraphs. Boeing, as a major contractor on SLS and Starliner, faced scrutiny. The problems were not just technical, they were cultural. Decisions were made that prioritize schedule or cost savings over rigorous testing. This is a pattern recognized in other large, complex projects. When the pressure is high, sometimes the wrong shortcuts are taken. The delays and cost overruns on both SLS and Starliner directly impact the national timeline for space exploration. The final reveal is about the impact of big cargo. Starship HLS can carry over 100 tons. That allows building a lunar base faster. It can carry habitats that are already pressurized and ready to live in. It can carry large solar power arrays. It can carry scientific labs. Apollo carried just a few hundred pounds of science gear. Starship can carry 100 tons, about as heavy as 15 fully loaded pickup trucks. This capability jump is what changes the strategic intelligence of the whole mission. It turns a visit into a permanent stay. This is where the idea of justice consequences applies. If Starship delivers on its promise, it proves that the commercial fast-paced model is superior for large-scale exploration. That forces traditional aerospace companies and even NASA to change their approach. Failure to adapt means falling behind. The competitive scoreboard shows China moving carefully, NASA moving slowly, and SpaceX moving quickly with aggressive testing. The human decision-making process is the true heart of the story. Who decided to build a disposable super-heavy rocket like SLS? It was a decision rooted in politics and history designed to keep a huge workforce busy. Who decided to bet on a fully reusable massive system like Starship? It was a decision driven by a single company's desire to colonize Mars, where cost efficiency is mandatory. Two different goals led to two very different competing systems. In the end, all paths aim for the moon, but the cost and the pace tell the story of two competing visions for the future of space travel. One is old and expensive, built on layers of oversight and historical decisions. The other is new and efficient, built on aggressive risk-taking and the relentless pursuit of reusability. By 2030, one of these systems will have proven its competence. The resulting success or failure will dictate how humanity explores not just the moon, but the entire solar system. That is the justice of the consequences.